My name is Michael Waddell. I am the McMahon Aquinas Chair here at St. Mary's, and along with the Center for Ethics and Culture from the University of Notre Dame, uh, I'm co-sponsoring uh, today's visit from Mark Comrad. Uh, I know that we have to be mindful of everyone's time, given that it's midday and students have classes and so forth, so, so I'm gonna cut right to the chase uh, and introduce our speaker. Um, it's my great pleasure to, to introduce to you Dr. Mark Comrad. Dr. Comrade completed his undergraduate degree in molecular biophysics and biochemistry at Yale University, and then went to uh, Duke University Medical School, where he completed his medical degree. Um, he then did his medical internship in his psychiatric residency at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Comrade is now the ethicist in residence for Shepherd Pratt Health Systems, where he chaired the ethics committee for more than 20 years. He's also on the teaching faculty of Johns Hopkins and the University of Maryland. Uh, in addition, he's a member of the Assembly of the American Psychiatric Association and previously served for six years on the APA Ethics Committee. Uh, in these two capacities, he helped to craft the APA position statement stating, quote, a psychiatrist should not prescribe or administer any intervention to a non-terminally ill person for the purpose of causing death, end quote. Dr. Comrade lectures widely throughout the US and Canada and Europe to address ethical concerns about suicidal psychiatric patients in Belgium and the Netherlands being voluntarily euthanized with lethal injection, very often by their own treating psychiatrists. He has consulted with policymakers in Canada, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, Norway, and Sweden, trying to dissuade them from establishing or extending laws permitting physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia for psychiatric patients. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Comrade with us today to speak on the topic, the role of leading psychiatrists in the US eugenics and sterilization movement and the Nazi Holocaust. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Comrade. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Thank you all so very much. Thank you to Dr. Waddell for inviting me and uh, for the kind uh, conversations and uh, friendly lunch that I had yesterday with uh, Dr. Squires uh, and his class uh, here today. So I very much appreciate an opportunity to speak with you. And I'm wondering, was anybody uh, at my lecture last night at the X Center? Uh, so several of you were. So just to recapitulate that, because I think it's important to understand why I'm giving this talk as uh, part of kind of a two talk series, which I promise you this will stand on its own, even if you aren't uh, on the first talk. Uh, and that is that I have been uh, traveling the world as an ethicist and practicing psychiatrist, as a clinician, very concerned about the emerging practices, particularly in the Netherlands and Belgium, uh, and uh, a couple of other European countries, and probably any day now in, in Canada, uh, whereby physician-assisted suicide and medical euthanasia is being provided uh, not just for end-of-life uh, terminally ill patients, which I consider problematic in its own right, uh, as I explained yesterday, but particularly for psychiatric patients uh, who are not terminally ill, uh, who uh, are being in these countries, several hundred of them each year, being euthanized on request by their treating psychiatrists, the very psychiatrists that were trying to prevent suicide and keep them alive uh, have by law and public policy and public demand uh, started to provide suicide by lethal injection primarily, which is the way it's done overseas, uh, in this uh, remarkable inversion of the fundamental values, ethos, and mission of what it means to be a psychiatrist, which is to try to find, help people find a path to a better future, uh, help mitigate their suffering, uh, travel with them in the journey of compassion in the midst of their suicidality and suffering, even possibly help them make meaning of suffering, uh, and yet, uh, several hundred patients a year are actually being uh, given suicide by lethal injection, as I say, uh, uh, mostly by the very same psychiatrist who had been trying to prevent that outcome for some years. So it's really a remarkable uh, development uh, here in this country. As I explained yesterday, we have uh, 
about eight jurisdictions, eight states where physician-assisted suicide is legal. That's not by injection. That's where the doctor writes a prescription. The patient goes to the pharmacy, gets a box full of barbiturates to take at the time and place of their own choosing, assuming that uh, a suicidal relative doesn't find it in the closet first. Um, but, uh, and that is a, a set of laws that is beginning to metastasize across the United States uh, and being very much oxygenated by the uh, winds from Europe where these remarkable practices are going on in these uh, very uh, liberal societies that have elevated autonomy and self-determination uh, to the exclusion of many other uh, moral values. And uh, of interest to this community is even in, Be in Belgium, even the Catholic Brothers of Charity, uh, who've had a 150-year-old uh, mission to run psychiatric hospitals and to provide psychiatric services as their uh, mission, uh, they, after 15 years of resisting this uh, incredible tsunami of moral change that's happening in their uh, uh, in their country, uh, they opened their psychiatric facilities to do euthanasia in eligible patients about a year and a half ago. So uh, that's how powerful those forces of changing social mores have been. Uh, and so therefore, I wanted to share with uh, students and faculty here that think deeply about medical values, uh, some historical notes uh, about another period of time where there were very rapidly and powerful changing social mores and in which physicians uh, and psychiatrists, my particular slice of the medical pie, uh, were swept along uh, by those mores and swept off the moorings of 2,500 years of uh, ethical values and principles uh, and went deeply down the uh, perverse rabbit hole of their societies. Uh, so we're going to look today at uh, two sides of the Atlantic. First is the United States and Canada uh, and the emergence of the eugenics movement that led to forced sterilization. And then in the second half, we will cross the Atlantic to look at uh, the uh, pre and uh, uh, both pre and post uh, Holocaust years uh, in which psychiatrists played a remarkable, uh, deadly, uh, and uh, very, very heinous role in actually helping to develop uh, the very techniques uh, that we now call the Holocaust. So the title here really captures my point, which is that ethics are vulnerable. So. I showed this slide last night. Melville writes, woe to him who seeks to please rather than to appall. And so my duty this morning is to appall you. Uh, and the relevance of this uh, history to my other topic is really spelled out very nicely by Catherine Frazee. says, the history of euthanasia and questions arising from the darkest corners of that history must not be out of bounds as we discuss assisted dying. One key to tackling complex problems is to ask the right questions, and that history through its cautionary tales and analogs is a rich vein of right questions. In the context of medically assisted death, surely some of those right questions will align with those that swirled in the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust. So this is a very important uh, point to revisit, uh, lest we lose the lessons of history. Right, let's start off by talking about uh, the United States situations in the first part of the 20th century um, with regard to eugenics and sterilization. And these uh, are three books that I relied on heavily in preparing this talk, and I commend them to you. Dow Biggins' book, Keeping America Sane, Psychiatry and Eugenics in the United States and Canada, The Origins of the Nazi Genocide, and uh, the most distinguished and celebrated of them all, Daniel Goldhagen's classic, Hitler's Willing Executioners, Ordinary Germans, and the Holocaust, making a powerful case for how the Holocaust was a bottom-up phenomenon from the populace rather than a top-down phenomenon imposed by uh, sociopathic rogues who bedazzled and, and ensorcelled their population. 
And by the way, this is a very cool thing, the eugenicsarchives.ca. It's a Canadian database, and you can click on any of the links, and it can take you off in all sorts of fascinating directions uh, if you're interested in getting into this more deeply, eugenicsarchive.ca. Uh, it's a nice pictorial database. All right, so the word eugenics was actually coined originally by Francis Galton, uh, who uh, was actually uh, a first cousin of Charles Darwin, uh, who wrote this uh, book, Inquiries into Human Faculty and Its Development, in uh, 1883. Uh, he was very immersed in social Darwinism, uh, the idea that uh, not only species would compete biologically, but societies would compete uh, for the survival of the fittest. Uh, that grew out of the work of his uh, far more famous cousin. Uh, he was actually the very first person who, to articulate the phrase nature versus nurture, a phrase that we now commonly use, uh, and especially when it comes to complex human behavior. He was quite interested in what came from biology and what came from environment. Uh, and he was most interested in what came from biology, and he coined this term, eugenics, which uh, is in his book, the study of the agencies under social control that improve or impair the racial qualities of future generations, either physically or mentally. So eugenics uh, really emerged from the new theories of evolution uh, and the idea that one could change the tenor, the fitness, the health of one's society uh, by looking at its members and by trying to figure out what characteristics of citizens in that society or uh, components of that society might actually have their basis in biology. Um, and at the same time, this was the emergence of uh, genetics, uh, first by Gregor Mendel, the guy who did the pea plant experiments. He actually uh, didn't entirely understand the significance of his work. And importing Mendel's findings into much more general science, uh, as well as general culture, was his experiments were kind of rediscovered around 1900 by these figures, uh, De Vries, Korins, and Bateson. They were all European scientists. Uh, and remember that at this time, DNA was uh, well before DNA was being discovered. So we knew there were some kind of principles that were transmitting uh, phenotypic qualities in the genotypes, uh, but even the whole idea of genes was uh, yet to be uh, discovered. But there are many, many organizations that began to become increasingly interested in this idea of eugenics uh, as a way of uh, considering how to better their societies. And there were several organizations uh, here in the United States that began to emerge around the turn of the century, uh, the most prominent being the American Breeders Association, the Human Betterment Foundation, the Race Betterment Foundation, the American Eugenics Society, and the Immigration Restriction League. These were all very similar organizations with kind of similar sounding names, and they were devoted to various aspects, uh, trying to control the flow of immigrants and screen out genetically undesirable immigrants, uh, and how to try to maximize racial health and racial qualities. And these were not uh, rogue and uh, obscure figures. Uh, many of the most prominent uh, cultural figures of their times participated, uh, and foundations very involved in this are foundations which to this day we recognize their names, Carnegie, Rockefeller, Harriman, Kellogg, and then uh, c celebrities of their time like uh, Clarence Darrow of the famous Scopes Evolution Trial, Alexander Graham Bell of the Telephone, Margaret Sanger, who we'll be hearing from shortly, the founder of Planned Parenthood and Women's Reproductive Rights, uh, Helen Keller, you all know, and Jack London, the famous author. These were people that were very, very involved with many of these organizations, uh, gave money to them, lent their uh, prestige to them. So one member of the American Breeders, Breeders Association uh, just happens to be uh, the president, uh, uh, one of the original presidents of Indiana University in this uh, great state. Um, and by the way, it's my first visit to Indiana, and I'm thoroughly charmed. Uh, but uh, thinking about David Starr Jordan uh, is not a particularly charming uh, uh, legacy of your state. He actually went on to become the founding president of Stanford University. He was the first chair of this committee uh, of eugenics that was part of the American Breeders Association. And he wrote this very important book that really was one of the inaugural ur texts 
of the eugenics movement, The Blood of the Nation, in 1902. And in it, he says, human qualities and conditions, such as talent and poverty, are passed through the blood. Um, I, thereafter, uh, the Carnegie, Rockefeller, and Harriman Foundations uh, got together to establish in Cold Spring Harbor, New York, this uh, remarkable institute. Uh, it's interesting, so uh, one of the sponsors of my coming here this weekend uh, is a kind of an institute of uh, ethics and culture. Well, this was an institute of eugenics. It was called the Eugenics Record Office. Uh, and uh, the founder uh, of it was uh, the famous Harvard zoologist, Charles Davenport, uh, who established what he called the eugenics creed uh, that was, uh, you know, you had to take not, you didn't have to take the oath, but there was a sense of a covenantial set of principles. And in the eugenics creed, it says, I believe I am the trustee of the germ plasm that I carry, that this has been passed on to me through thousands of generations before me. I will not betray that trust. Uh, and then the director, the first director, was the famous Princeton biologist, uh, uh, Harry Hamilton Laughlin. Uh, who was actually very involved in some of the early laws, crafting the laws for compulsive sterilization that we will see. Uh, and then uh, Robert Yerkes, who was the chair of the Committee on Inheritance of Mental Traits in the Eugenic Records Office. He was a very prominent psychologist at Harvard and then Yale, and was president uh, for a while of the American Psychological Association. So I just want you to understand that the influential figures in all of this were leading figures of their time. Uh, not not uh, bad apples, not uh, roguish uh, uh, people who were way off the reservation. They were leaders of their professional society. Uh, he uh, said, no one of us as a citizen can afford to ignore the menace of race deterioration. So um, the principles uh, of the eugenics movement, which uh, the hub of which was this uh, eugenics records office, were that uh, a variety of human traits were largely determined by genetics, uh, and that social problems could thereby be uh, solved uh, by basically uh, uh, sifting the population uh, using uh, genetic reasoning. Uh, they were into family planning, education, uh, very much uh, about setting up strictures for immigration, and finally, as we will see, sterilization. They pursued a lot of research into the genetic transmission of undesirable traits. They were obsessed with family trees and pedigrees. And this is very important, and that is intelligence testing. Uh, for both the Army and of ultimately uh, the SAT, Robert Yerkes for the Army and Carl Brigham for the SAT. These were founded with eugenics thinking. Uh, now, you know, you think about the SAT as something that uh, all of you, most of you took uh, to get here, uh, but in fact it had its origins in trying to separate the wheat from the chaff, uh, trying to figure out which uh, people were less desirable because it was believed that intelligence was a genetically founded trait and almost entirely. Uh, so it was used to parse the population and particularly to screen out undesirable immigrants or people undesirable for the army. And a lot of this research ended up focusing on the mentally ill and the people in lower classes. Lewis Terman, who actually created the first major intelligence test, the Stanford Binet test, was a member of the Human Betterment Foundation and uh, was at Stanford, uh, he said, not all criminals are feeble-minded, but feeble-minded persons are potentially criminals. And that every feeble-minded woman is a potential prostitute would hardly be disputed by anyone. Uh, so feeble-minded, by the way, was a, is an old term. We'll see it come up. It actually uh, was, uh, it, it, it was an amalgam of what today we would d distinguish as two groups, developmentally disabled uh, and mentally ill, and they were all kind of linked under feeble-minded, but this was the attitude of the great uh, Lewis Terman who invented the Stanford Binet test. Uh, now, uh, here's another uh, important mental health figure, uh, Henry Goddard. He was the uh, director of the largest uh, institute for feeble-minded children uh, in New Jersey, the Vineland School, uh, and Goddard uh, studied one particular uh, person who actually w was uh, we now know was, uh, would be considered sort of an average IQ person, uh, 
and how she ended up at the Vineyard School is a whole other story, Deborah Kalakak. Uh, and he did this study of the Kalakak family, uh, looking at the genetic tree of the family, purporting to demonstrate that uh, there was a degenerate branch of the family who was into poverty and substance abuse and so forth, and then a very successful part of the family, and that the degenerate part came from an original ancestor who slept with a barmaid of a lower social class, and that's what led to the degenerate. Anyhow, it turns out all of that was anecdotal information that all turned out to be wrong. But I cannot emphasize how important the Kalakak family study was to the entire eugenics movement. So the entire thing was built on these kinds of studies that subsequently turned out to be an extraordinarily spurious. Uh, so uh, the research was uh, published uh, in uh, very prestigious journals. Uh, by the scientific standards of the time, Friedlander writes, eugenics research was on the cutting edge of science. Its practitioners were respected scholars from various scientific disciplines who occupied important positions in American universities, published their results in major scholarly journal. Their research tools were the most advanced available at the time, and they prided themselves on their meticulously developed methods. The research results of the eugenicists were accepted not only by fellow scientists, but by national policymakers. Interestingly, if you look closely uh, from 1968 to 1969, uh, well after the uh, era of the flourishing eugenics, eugenics kind of became a dirty word, so the journal changed its name from Eugenics Quarterly to Social Biology, and that is still being published to this day. So it did influence policymakers even as high as the President of the United States. Uh, imagine a President of the United States actually having uh, certain biases against immigrants. Uh, but, indeed, Franklin Roosevelt uh, did uh, and wrote, no sensible American wants to see this country to be made a dumping ground for foreigners of any nation. It becomes, therefore, a question of selection, but European blood of the right sort does a lot of good. So at the highest national policy levels, developing filters for filtering out bad blood, uh, as it was called, were developed. So <clears throat> as a result, we saw the emergence uh, of uh, not just uh, filtering out who was coming into the country, but also filtering the next generation um, through uh, a series of forced sterilizations. Uh, because if you certainly couldn't change someone's genes, but you might be able to prevent them from reproducing. So Indiana, this state, had the uh, ignominious distinction of being the very first state to have a forced sterilization law. It applied to inmates of mental institutions, people convicted of uh, a couple of uh, sex crimes, which included homosexuality, by the way, uh, moral degenerates, which were basically substance abuse people, mostly alcoholics in those days, uh, the feeble-minded by IQ tests, uh, which were very important, and epileptics. Uh, forcing these uh, people against their will, sometimes adults, sometimes children, uh, to have uh, tubal ligations or vasectomies uh, to force them to be sterilized in the interest of society. California it was a, a really the most important place of all uh, because that's where the majority of the activity was. It was a law in 1909 the second state to come online for forced sterilization, and it allowed specifically superintendents of psychiatric hospitals to do this. this the psych hospitals were very much recruited into this program, and psychiatrists very, uh, at that time, uh, enthusiastically uh, f followed, thinking that they were moral pioneers uh, doing uh, the best for their society, actually not unlike uh, the attitudes of the psychiatrists that are providing uh, voluntary euthanasia uh, over in Belgium and the Netherlands. But the law was vague. It could be applied to people uh, in general. Uh, and uh, it's interesting how language has changed. There was something in those days called the State Lunacy Commission uh, in California at the turn of the century. They had the authority to order a sterilization involuntarily uh, 
for people with certain mental illnesses. And we know a lot of this because in 2007, in an old filing cabinet in the basement of the Department of Mental Health in California's capital, Sacramento, they discovered all of this microfilm uh, that contained the sterilization recommendation forms for nearly 20,000 patients. So we've been able to get some data about that. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we know is that these large state hospitals, uh, all of which were psychiatric institutions in California, uh, were virtual factories. Uh, many patients were admitted solely for the purpose of being sterilized. Uh, and in fact, 33, one out of three steril forced sterilizations in the United States occurred in one of these six hospitals in California. So they were very active. Uh, they ended up performing over 20,000 sterilizations uh, over the years. This one hospital, Stockton, did 40% of the uh, sterilizations in California. Uh, and we know from these records that uh, some of the demographics uh, the majority of people, about two-thirds, had mental, is what we would now call mental illnesses, and uh, uh, the rest, developmental disabilities, uh, often called mental retardation. That's a term that's uh, losing its currency. So this is about the distribution, and three times as many women as men, because uh, those were the ones that we were especially worried about becoming prostitutes, as Terman said. Uh, and uh, even though African Americans were 1% of the population, they were 4% uh, of the sterilized, so they were represented over threefold. Uh, and Mexican Americans, especially in California, uh, were actually the largest uh, ethnic group that was sterilized. And you can see here that the sterilizations continued. This is not just ancient history. Uh, this continued through 1983, uh, which happens to be uh, the year that I graduated med school. So the year I graduated med school, in my lifetime, there were, uh, there were uh, still sterilizations. In fact, from 1960 to 1983, uh, there were 85 sterilizations. But as you can see, to in California, there were a total of 20,000 over those years. So by 1926, this had metastasized, much in the way that physician-assisted suicide laws are now metastasizing, uh, to state after state. There were 14 states that had compulsory sterilization laws by 1926. And then in 1927, we hit the famous case, the infamous case in legal history of Buck versus Bell. This revolved around Carrie Buck, who was 18. She was said to have the mental age of nine. Uh, her mother was a prostitute, uh, and she was born out of wedlock, so she was put in po foster care. Uh, and as a teenager, she became pregnant. Uh, and as often happened in those days, if uh, you were feeble-minded and you became pregnant, the family committed her to the, excuse me, the Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and the Feeble-Minded. By the way, it's later determined that she got pregnant by rape. Uh, the superintendent there, uh, Albert Pretty, who, uh, the psychiatrist, uh, declared that Buck is a genetic threat to society. Uh, and again, in Virginia, they didn't have yet a compulsory sterilization law. So he requested that he, uh, he have used her as a test case to try to initiate sterilization. And the legal uh, argument went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, uh, and which ultimately approved it uh, and actually once the doors were opening in Virginia, dozens of other states were followed because now it was national law. And uh, one of our most famous and celebrated jurists wrote an infamous uh, opinion in support of this forced sterilization uh, endeavor, which is Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, who we celebrate now as you know, one of the great intellectuals of American history. And here's his famous statement in Buck versus Bell. We've seen that public welfare may call upon the best citizens for their lives. It would be strange if it could not call upon those who already sap the strength of the state for lesser sacrifices in order to prevent our being swamped with incompetence. It is better for all the world if, instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their, their kind. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. A phrase uh, that resounds in the hall of infamy uh, to this day. 
the famous Oliver Wendell Holmes. So by 1935, 30 states had compulsory sterilization laws. Uh, California, as I said, was the most active. North Carolina was the second most active. Uh, they had uh, their law in 1929. It was the 17th state. Uh, about 40% were African Americans, although after 1960, continued all the way through 83, as you see, just like California, uh, the majority of people being sterilized were African Americans, mostly females, uh, about uh, three to one uh, developmentally disabled versus uh, other kinds of psychiatric disorder. Uh, and again, all the way through 1983. So uh, through that, uh, time there were in, the, in this country over 65,000 forced sterilizations in 33 different states. So I do want to mention, I'm not going to belabor this for this particular audience, I go into this more detail when I talk to my colleagues, but there were many prominent psychiatrists that were involved and physicians were very important uh, in this broad side. Uh, it's interesting, it shows the new Cupid, the guy carrying the MD doctor's bag, uh, the doctors were felt to be very instrumental in trying to advise patients uh, about what would be genetically suitable matches. Uh, but eugenics was a particularly attractive to psychiatrists because what was happening is we were not making much progress in curing mental disorders. Uh, whereas our surgical colleagues and our infectious disease colleagues were making great strides in their therapeutic efficacy. So because we couldn't find a cure, uh, we instead in psychiatry were lured into prevention, uh, how to prevent mental disorders and eugenics, uh, both in terms of screening immigrant populations and sterilization, uh, became an attractive way for us to feel effective uh, by uh, T taking our untreatable conditions and at least keeping them from multiplying. Uh, so there were many prominent psychiatrists, uh, George Alfred Bloomer, who was president of the American Psychiatric Association, uh, the father of Canadian psychiatry, Charles Clark, very involved in eugenics programs to screen out immigrants. Uh, Thomas Salmon, who was also the APA president, uh, was very active in the eugenics movement. I won't get into these details except to show you that William Partlow, who was superintendent for another one of the largest institutes, the Home for the Feeble-Minded in Alabama, uh, he petitioned uh, the Alabama legislature to allow him and only him to sterilize every single member of his facility. Uh, he later went on to try to convince the legislature to allow all superintendents of all psychiatric hospitals in Alabama to sterilize all their patients. Uh, and the legislature approved it twice, but in the, the great wisdom of the governor, the governor vetoed it twice. So only Partlow was active in Alabama. And here it shows you uh, he did a total of 224 over the course of those years in his institution. Now, it was inevitable that uh, once, if you start thinking deeply and seriously and your uh, philosophy becomes uh, uh, unmoored to more foundational and uh, venerable long-lived principles, you start to think, well, gee, if we can sterilize, uh, maybe we could take it one step further. Uh, maybe we can euthanize. Uh, maybe we can actually start, you know, because it's very, we, we're not capturing everybody and some of the sterilizations don't work. Maybe we can actually start to pluck off uh, certain members of the population in the name of eugenics. Uh, again, noble purpose, moral pioneering. Uh, so this actually started to become uh, talked about and uh, the Carnegie Foundation, again, here we are, uh, they uh, had a committee on, uh, of the uh, eugenics uh, of uh, they funded of the American Breeders Association a study about how to effectively cut off the defective germ plasm in the human population and they listed 12 different steps that could be taken and step number eight was euthanasia by gas chamber. Uh, and um, matter of fact one of the leading textbooks if you were uh, a uh, undergraduate in 1918, you would be reading Paul uh, Papineau's textbook on applied eugenics, uh, where you would learn from a historical point of view, the first method which presents itself is execution. Its value in keeping up the standard of the race should not be underestimated. Uh, Paul Papineau would have been your teacher uh, rather than David uh, or Michael. 
Even Helen Keller got on the bandwagon. It seems to me that the simplest, wisest thing to do would be to submit cases uh, like that of a mal malformed idiot baby to a jury of expert physicians. The evidence before a jury of physicians would be exact and scientific. Their findings would be free from the prejudice and inaccuracy of untrained observations. They would act, and she was talking about euthanizing, only in cases of true idiocy where there could be no hope of mental development. So uh, infanticide, uh, she was in favor of how ironic that Helen Keller, uh, with her blindness and her muteness and her deafness, uh, would advocate for you know, there, there are levels of disability, all right, well, maybe she had a level of disability that she could still function through, but maybe those who couldn't achieve that, she felt we should have uh, dispassionate scientific evaluations for infanticide. Uh, and then Margaret Sanger. Uh, Margaret Sanger uh, is uh, often celebrated uh, by uh, reprodu uh, women's reproductive advocates as having promoted uh, birth control and uh, developed the whole Planned Parenthood Foundation. But here is a historical reenactment of a true uh, event in which uh, she was asked to address the wives of the KKK. her actual words to the women of the KKK. Well, moving in contemporarily, you know, certainly we're still to this day having discussions about who can enhance our society and who degrades our society uh, and trying to control our borders. Uh, and it's very much, uh, once again, uh, front and center in the political scene. Uh, and I really, you need to understand the whole historical legacy of that. But even forced uh, sterilization is uh, in the news. Now, one point is that uh, in 2013, North Carolina actually uh, devoted reparations to people who were sterilized, over $10 million. Uh, they paid out to about 7,600 North Carolinians who had been forcibly sterilized. But it's not over. So for example, in uh, 2013, nearly 150 women were offered sterilization in California's prisons. Remember, what a coercive environment to be in, to be offered. Uh, you know, we, the whole, in medical ethics, you're probably, if you haven't yet studied, uh, you know, uh, uh, the participation, the ethics of participating in human experimentation and research, and particularly some of the squirrely uh, aspects of doing that with prisoners uh, in a coercive environment. So these women were offered early parole uh, if they were sterilized, uh, and the inmates were seen, you know, at being at risk of recidivism. Uh, those are the ones who were especially offered early parole. That was just 2013. A Tennessee judge uh, in 2017. Uh, was also offering reduced jail time in exchange for sterilization to shave off 30 days from your sentence, and he was reprimanded. Uh, but these kinds of uh, ideas and sentiments are still there. And here in 2012, this physician, who was also a state se Republican state senator in Missouri, uh, talking about the opioid crisis, said, well, if they overdose and kill themselves, it just removes them from the gene pool. Uh, so eugenics thinking uh, is uh, still uh, alive. It certainly isn't dominating, uh, at least in an explicit fashion, uh, our public policy the way that it used to, uh, but uh, it is still there. All right, now let's cross the Atlantic uh, to Nazi Germany. Goldhagen reminds us uh, there a cognitive moral revolution which reversed the processes that have been shaping Europe for centuries was occurring. A new ethos to reconstitute the European social landscape according to racial biological principles. It is very important for you all to understand as we think about Nazi Germany and some of the racial laws that we'll see in a moment and some of the really heinous uh, programs 
for first sterilization and then euthanization. Uh, this was actually an American export. I really want you to understand that we were experimenting with this uh, for decades before Nazi Germany, and Hitler was studying us with great interest. I've studied with interest laws of several American states concerning prevention of reproduction by people who would be of no value or injurious to the racial stock. Uh, and in fact, uh, he imported a number of major American intellectuals to Germany, rewarded them with academic appointments, rewarded them with uh, 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 editorships of leading eugenics journals, uh, rewarded them with medals of honor, uh, Americans uh, who were very active in eugenics and forced sterilization uh, in the US. And again, these were not obscure people. These were not rogue people. These were uh, people that were celebrated uh, in their time. Now, we had our eugenics records office on Cold Spring Harbor. Remember that, the ERO. They had their Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Anthropology, Human Heredity, and Genetics. Uh, what's interesting is it was a division of the German Research Institute for Psychiatry. So as I, when I talk to my psychiatric colleagues, I really want to understand, unlike the ERO, which was its own independent thing, this whole enterprise was under the rubric of psychiatry. It was actually found, uh, it was funded by our American Rockefeller Foundation uh, in 1924. Its director, uh, was a very, very celebrated psychiatrist, Ernst Rudin, who was also the president of the German Psychiatric Association, so sort of their equivalent of the organization that I'm active and involved in, the American Psychiatric Association. He, he was their president. He was awarded the Goethe Medal uh, for his researches, uh, being emblazoned with the phrase, pioneer of racial hygiene. It's particularly uh, imp important to a little historical note that uh, the Goethe Medal, which was sort of, at the time, the Nobel Prize uh, in Germany, uh, and they gave it for science, and they gave it for literature, and so forth. Uh, Sigmund Freud was a winner of the Goethe Medal, and he felt that the greatest honor that he had ever achieved, at least uh, up, up until they th he had to flee the country. Uh, but he, uh, he was a fellow recipient of the Goethe Medal. Uh, the infamous Dr. Mengele, that many of you might recognize as doing experiments in concentration camps, especially on children and twins, he would actually bring his tissue samples to the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. Uh, and there were departments of racial anthropology, human heredity, and genetics. Well, like in the US, uh, uh, following our example, uh, laws began to emerge in Germany for forced sterilization. Uh, for the prevention of offspring with hereditary diseases. Uh, and you can see here the list of some of the things that were el uh, kind of conditions that were eligible for forced sterilizations uh, of children, teenagers, and young adults re of reproductive age, congenital feeble-mindedness, uh, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, Huntington's, you can, you can read the list. Uh, the referrals largely came from the physicians who were charged with treating the, their patients. They readily uh, channeled their own patients towards this program. And like in the US, it was largely performed in the large state psychiatric hospitals. Uh, they became the uh, epicenter uh, and the factories for sterilization and then what followed, which was uh, even worse. Uh, remember, we had accomplished uh, over the course of uh, many decades, about uh, 60,000 ster forced sterilizations in the U.S. Just between 1934 and 39, there were almost half a million forced sterilizations, mostly of people with mental illness and developmental disability, a half a million just in the course of those five years. Uh, and this, uh, we now have some data uh, to show how it parsed there. It was more the, the majority, unlike the California data I showed you, were uh, developmental uh, abnormalities, birth defects, and so forth, about a third uh, major mental illness, and then a small group of others. Then the next step was the development of racial laws, uh, the so-called Nuremberg Racial Law. It was targeted primarily against Jews, uh, and it read, no Jew can become a Reich citizen because German blood is a prerequisite in the citizenship code 
and this also applies to gypsies and Negroes. Uh, but in fact, uh, physicians had to do a family tree and to certify uh, that you had no Jewish or Negro or gypsy blood uh, in order to get a marriage license. Here's the, the new Cupid again. Uh, you had to get certified for racial fitness to marry uh, in 1935 and thereafter. And some of those uh, investigations were family histories and trees and so forth, but then there was all this weird sort of an anthropometric science in which they would measure your nose and measure your head size uh, and come up with uh, all sorts of pseudoscientific conclusions that because your nose is so big or because you're the, the width of your head, the ratio of the width to the, to the uh, length of your head, uh, you must be of Jewish origin uh, or Negro uh, somewhere in your, in your blood, uh, in your family tree and you couldn't be issued a marriage certificate. And the racial laws were not just about marriage. Uh, they were also about employment, academic appointments and departments and so forth. It actually led to quite a brain drain from Germany at that point of intellectuals and professionals and so forth who couldn't get jobs because they didn't meet the racial standards. I just bring out the marriage part because that's a part that physicians were heavily involved in because they had to certify you for marriage. As a matter of fact, Physicians uh, really flocked to the Nazi party. By 1945, almost half of the physicians in Germany had joined the party, and the most vicious uh, and, and sadistic portion of the party was the SS. 7% uh, of the SS uh, were physicians, even though physicians constituted only half a percent of the population. So physicians were overrepresented by a factor of 35 in the SS. Uh, these are the kinds of uh, public relations and uh, advertising that was going on at the time. Uh, this uh, shows an obviously disabled person physically. Uh, 60,000 Reichsmarks is what this person suffered from a hereditary defect costs the people's community during his lifetime. And in movie theaters, uh, movies such as this were shown. I have just a, a minute excerpt of this 12-minute uh, film, but uh, look at just this example of what people who went to the movies would see. It's a silent film. You see the appeal to cost. Uh, remember, G Germany was really suffering post-World War I. Uh, the economy was really uh, uh, quite unstable. And in fact, you know, part of the reason for the initiation of a new war effort was to spin up uh, the military-industrial complex. Uh, but a lot of Germans were suffering uh, from uh, financial hardship. And so the appeal, look at what these people are costing us. Uh, really sold. So remember I showed you the discovery of the microfilms in the basement of Sacramento. So uh, the Stasi, the East German secret police archives, were open to the public in 1992. Uh, and we learned uh, all sorts of things uh, about the Holocaust in general, but specifically about the program that I'm now about to teach you, uh, which started when uh, 
the uh, father of five-year-old Gerhard Kretschmer in Leipzig petitioned to Hitler to enter in the life of his disabled son. And Hitler dispatched his personal physician, Karl Brandt, to authorize his death as an act of mercy. He was killed by lethal injection while the nurses were taking a coffee break. A few days after he died, 15 psychiatrists were summoned to Hitler's chancellery and told him that a secret euthanasia program dreamed of by Hitler for more than a decade was to be put into effect. And here is the edict uh, signed on September 1st by Adolf Hitler that says, Reichsleiter Buhr and Doctor of Medicine Brandt, his personal physician, are charged with the responsibility of enlarging the competence of certain physicians designated by name so that patients who, on the basis of human judgment, are considered incurable can be granted mercy death after a discerning diagnosis. So these were the two people that were that stood up a program uh, that became the first mass killing program, and it was focused on the mentally ill. It was headquartered in this house here in Gartenstrasse, for a co-opted uh, mansion of a Jewish family. Uh, in 1940, six hospitals were devoted to processing cases. Uh, however, the Stasi record showed that it eventually extended to almost 300 facilities in Germany, Austria, and the Czech Republic. Uh, an elaborate mechanism, a uh, big flow chart uh, of how people would be processed. Uh, and in fact, again, they felt themselves moral pioneers. The assistant chief of Hitler's chancellery said, we welcomed it because it was based on the ethical principle of sympathy and had humane considerations in its favor. And I admit there were imperfections in its execution, but that does not change the decency of the original idea as Buhler, Brandt, and I myself understood it. So the process uh, was requests were sent to local governments to provide a list of institutions that held mental patients, epileptics, and the feeble-minded. So for example, the city of Hamburg sent a list of 10 institutions that had over 6,000 patients with possible uh, eligible patients. It all started with children, minors. Uh, and you can see the diagnoses that were being looked for. This was the reporting form that the T4 uh, program generated. Uh, and you would fill out these forms. Uh, and um, in fact, uh, if you filled out a form, you were, uh, as a nurse or as a doctor, you were given uh, 28 uh, Reich marks for each report. So again, it began with children uh, in these large hospitals uh, who were hospitalized for developmental disabilities and mental illness. Uh, it uh, actually authorized uh, the learning of, of such children to the hospital by uh, deceiving the parents, tell them, we'd like to have your child in so we could possibly cure them of their condition. Well, later, after they were euthanized, they were told, oh, they died of some complication. And because all the bodies were ultimately cremated, which became the disposal method of choice in Nazi Germany, they were told, oh, they, they had an infectious disease. So we had to, uh, to, we can't return the body to you. They would take them in these gray buses, uh, the so-called gekrocked buses. The entire local population knew what these gray buses were. Uh, and oftentimes, the patients were very upset, disturbed, screaming. Wild scenes would take place when they were collected and brought into the gekrocked buses and taken to the killing centers. And just like in uh, the California hospitals, these large, uh, psychiatric institutions uh, throughout Germany were the centers uh, whereby these uh, killings and then cremations would take place. Uh, it was, they were, the program was run mostly by psychiatrists or their trainees. It was mostly children at first and then adults. And they had to develop with such a massive killing program new techniques for how you could uh, kill a lot of people at once uh, that really hadn't been uh, developed uh, heretofore. So they tried narcotics. It was very inefficient. Overdoses, starvation and freezing was too slow. Firing squads were a problem because the uh, killing of children by firing squads was causing a big problem with PTSD in the soldiers who did not like this. So we needed to spare the soldiers' mental health. Uh, gassing with truck exhaust was ineffective, and ultimately the effective technique was developed by the head of the T4 program, psychiatrist William Haida. Uh, 
uh, with carbon monoxide gassing, which turned out to be the method used throughout most of the concentration camps. You may have heard of the cyanide Zyklon B gas that was actually only used in five of the 2,000 concentration camps later. But it was developed on, in the T4 program on the mentally ill by psychiatrist Werner Haida. Hitler's personal physician said about all this, we're making major advances in medical history. And the gassing was a medical procedure. The doctor, the psychiatrist, had to be the one to turn the, the knob, to turn the faucet. It was uh, a, a medical thing. And then the bodies were cremated. And letters were written to families, uh, letter, lying letters. You know, your husband's illness did not encourage hope for his improvement, and this was no longer any expectations he'd be released. One can understand his death as a deliverance. This particular person said, was said to have died from an infectious disease. Look at the enthusiastic T4 nurses. Goldhagen writes, they didn't just conform to the prevailing ethos. Such an undertaking depended on people applying themselves with energy, energy that rise from, derives from great enthusiasm uh, for the project. Um, I'm going to skip this particular slide and just show you the head of the program, Werner Haida. I mean, again, these were not rogue, bad apple, ob obscure, back alley physicians. Werner Haida was the chair of uh, psychiatry at the University of Würzburg, one of the most venerable medical institutions for a thousand years. Paul Nietzsche, who succeeded him, uh, was superintendent of the largest psychiatric asylum on the continent, uh, the Sonnenstein Asylum. And he says, well, outsiders have not been able to appreciate how psychiatry especially rendered a fundamental service when its scientific findings revealed the grave danger imposed by de genetic degeneration. Uh, there were major professors uh, uh, that were also involved in the program, like the chair of psychiatry at Cologne and at Heidelberg, uh, as well as minor professors who uh, attached themselves for their careers uh, as you would, you know, a good intern, a good resident, a good fellow who attaches him or herself uh, to uh, a senior prestigious person. And so there were juniors who worked in the program. And then some very famous people that we now recognize uh, were, were feeding the system. So just recently we've come to understand that Hans Asperger uh, of uh, Asperger's disorder fame uh, wrote less favorable cases of autism will roam the streets grotesque and dilapidated. So he recommended the transfer of many cases of autism uh, to uh, one of the killing centers, the Spielgrund in Vienna. Uh, he successfully sought to accommodate himself to the Nazi regimen and was actually rewarded with career opportunities in return. Some people want to defend him and say, well, he articulated a high end of the autistic spectrum to be able to spare some people. Uh, not the autistic people who would roam the streets grotesque and dilapidated. And uh, Conrad Lorenz, the Nobel Prize winner for uh, attachment uh, uh, for, for uh, classical conditioning and, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, attachment theory. He wrote, the racial idea as the basis of our state has already accomplished must, much. We must and should rely on the best of us and charge them with the extermination of elements of the population loaded with dregs. So some of the major figures and heroes in the history of psychiatry and psychology in the 20th century uh, were very much involved with this. The target uh, of the T4 program was for every thousand citizens, uh, it felt that maybe 10 of them would require psychiatric treatment and five of them uh, would require inpatient treatment and one of them would probably be eligible for euthanasia. So the goal was 65 to 70,000 euthanasias and they ultimately achieved 400,000. Now, was there an opposition? Yes, not much though. Did the German Association of Psychiatry and Neurology say anything? No. Did the Austrian Psychiatric Association say anything? No. Did any bioethics organization in the world say anything? No. Did the American Psychiatric Association say anything? Not that I've been able to tell. Nobody spoke up. As Auden says, wrote, intellectual disgrace stares from every human face and the seas of pity lie locked and frozen in each eye. 
But there were a few important ones. Cardinal Clemens von Galen, the so-called Lion of Munster, he opposed the T4 program, and he had a significant enough position in the church that he was protected. Uh, Dr. Karl Bonhoeffer, who was uh, chief of psychiatry at Berlin, uh, initially uh, uh, supported sterilization, but refused to participate when they tried to recruit him into T4. But his famous son, the German Protestant uh, uh, theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer was actually very instrumental in slowing this down. Actually, it was thanks to his efforts that they stopped doing children and started to convert to adults. So I'm not sure how much he accomplished, but he was such an oppositionist that he was later uh, executed uh, for his effort. But their outcry did slow things down at about the 70,000 mark when they tried to, when they ended up switching to adults. But really, the T4 program was the fulcrum for the Holocaust. It was those techniques that were later parlayed into the concentration camps, where initially, by the way, in the concentration camps, the first people to be uh, gassed and executed, um, even before they started on the Jews, were uh, the disabled. Um, and when they finally had the Wanna See conference on the final solution, uh, ultimately, uh, that was extended to the Jews. But again, all of this was piloted in the T4 program. In the transvalued world of Germany during the Nazi era, ordinary Germans deemed the killing of the mentally ill and the Jews to be a beneficent act for humanity. Well, a number of the doctors were caught and put on trial at the Nuremberg trial. Uh, seven were acquitted, seven had death sentences, nine had prison sentences. Uh, but most of the surviving doctors were eventually reemployed in Germany and elsewhere, uh, and actually many of them ended up coming to the United States. There are now monuments uh, in Germany to the gray buses. Uh, but uh, this is very important. Leo Alexander, who was a psychiatrist, was the chief physician in charge of uh, gathering the information for the Nazi doctor's trial. And he wrote in this famous article in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, all, all that he had learned in two years of working with these uh, Nazi physician criminals. Uh, and he wrote in this article, the beginnings at first were merely a subtle shift in emphasis in the basic attitude among physicians. It started with the acceptance of the attitude basic in the euthanasia movement that there is such a thing as life not worthy to be lived. This attitude in its early stages concerned itself merely with the severely and chronically ill. Gradually, the sphere was enlarged to encompass the socially unproductive, the ideologically unwanted, the racially unwanted, and finally, all non-Germans. It is important to realize that the infinitely small, wedged-in level from which this entire trend of mind received its impetus was the attitude towards the non-rehabilitatable sick. It wasn't until 2010 that the renamed uh, German Psychiatric Association apologized publicly. Uh, here he is uh, at a conference uh, begging the forgiveness uh, of the victims that suffered in the name of German psychiatry and for the silence, trivialization, and denial that far too long characterized psychiatry in post-war Germany. So here is how it happens. Here is how things become unhooked from their social mores. You have uh, fr from their moorings. You have changing social mores uh, that change the fulcrum of what's a life worth living and what's not. Physicians, as citizens, become affected by these changes, and those new values ask for new approaches and new services by physician. Organized medicine buys uh, into it. Its leadership buys into it. The most prominent uh, uh, factors, uh, people in the, uh, in the medical uh, profession uh, get on board, and the new ethos becomes the new normal, uh, and that established medical ethics starts to bend towards social mores, and the old ethics become effete. And we are seeing the same process now emerging in the development of physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia. I'm going to skip Booker Washington, but I do want to articulate Robert Lifton, who wrote the famous book, The Nazi Doctors, has this idea of malignant normality. What we put forward as self-evident and normal may actually be deeply dangerous and destructive. And Arthur Kaplan, the great American bioethicist and my mentor, writes, bioethics has been speechless in the face of the crimes of Nazi doctors, precisely because so many of them believed they were doing what was morally right. 
It's comforting to believe that healthcare professionals from the nation that was the world's leader in medicine at the time, who had pledged an oath to do no harm, could not conduct themselves so brutally, or to think that anyone who espouses racist eugenics ideas can't be a competent introspective physician. Well, Nazi medical crimes show that these beliefs are false. Jeffrey Riley of the New Orleans Theological Seminary are reflecting now bringing it forward to what's happening in Belgium and the Netherlands. What happened in Bel Netherlands and Belgium can with the same legal sleight of hand happen here. Popular indifference, justification by et experts and elites, judicial sanction and legislative endorsement change the cultural view of life and create an environment where conflicting worldviews clash about God, the nature of the world, and human identity. This is no slippery slope. This is the way cultures change. And the, our culture went through similar transformations in the eugenics era and the Holocaust era that is not so far away. As Voltaire said, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> I know that many of the students will need to get on to their next classes, so um, in order to respect your time, um, what I'll suggest is that if you have questions for Dr. Comrade, simply approach him at the podium, and I'm sure he'll be happy to visit with you. Um, let me thank all of you for, for coming, for being here today, and ask you please to join me in thanking Dr. Comrade one more time.